You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before for trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means it is time yet again for the Crypto Rundown, the program where we break down all the the weird and wild and Wondrous stuff going on in the world of crypto. So we got the spot Bitcoin and the futures and the altcoin, also the options, of course, and the volatility and the skew and all that good stuff. There's a lot going on. So let's get to it. I got a great desk to help me do just that. So let's dive right on into the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the Crypto Hot Seat. All right, everybody. It's time for the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and proceed to pick their brains. For the benefit of you, the listener, today's guest is a newcomer. To the program and indeed to the network, he is Simon Nursey, the co-founder of the Cora Network. Simon, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Thank you very much, Mark. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And Simon, as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here on the program, why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of an overview in, of your background in the derivative space and indeed the crypto space, as well as how you found your way to starting the Cora Network. Yeah, sure. Um, so... Yeah, as me as a way of background, um, I come from the world of FX options. I've been trading for the last twenty years, um, mostly out of uh, Singapore. Um, initially for BNP Paribas, where I was global head of FX options trading, um, and then at Standard Chartered, where I ran the the Asia activity. Um, I also do a, a little sideline teaching at the uh, National University of Singapore, where. Uh, where I teach uh, postgrad students uh, an introduction to the realities of trading, I'm trying to bridge that uh, gap between the uh, clean, efficient, uh, model-driven world that they're taught and uh, and the realities of uh, of our markets. Yeah, unfortunately, they still do that, don't they? They still teach them all the nice things to expect, uh, nothing to do with the real world when they when they actually collide with uh, with the markets. There, it's a shame. We need to get some more pragmatic teaching in the academic world. I think. 
there's there's definitely a there's definitely a gap there, and uh, I, as you can imagine, I've had uh, very little need for uh, Ito's lemma in my last twenty years. Uh, well, Simon, let's let's kick it off. There, you kind of touched on a little bit of your background, but tell us. We we also want to talk about all things crypto. So maybe let, let's start with this. I like to ask everybody who comes from a more traditional financial background in the, you know in the options and derivatives world. Everyone has that moment where they first discovered this crypto thing might have more legs to it than they thought. What was what was that inflection point that come to Jesus? That awakening moment for you in the world of crypto. <laughs> Um, well, it, obviously, it's a uh, it's an extremely exciting market. Uh, there's uh, lots going on, and uh, and it's all very very uh, raw. Um, coming from uh, FX options, where uh, volatilities have been declining over a uh, a long period of years, and we're seeing um, uh, increasing electronic electronification, uh, tighter and tighter spreads. It's um, Getting involved with the uh, crypto space is uh, really a, a breath of fresh air, and uh, and it's you know it's uh, great to see something so so active, volatile, and uh, and with so many opportunities still in it. Do you remember? Do you remember what first was that really drew your attention to it and away from the, the FX world of options and into crypto? <laughs> oh, it, it was. Probably when I uh, logged on and discovered that there was a uh, that there was an options market that existed and uh, and and started sort of connecting up to different people in the market and uh, and realised that you know the, 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 there's a whole ecosystem that exists around uh, crypto now and it's uh, it, it it suddenly became clear to me that we weren't dealing with um, a flash in the pan you uh, know little. Uh, uh, little speculative trends, but uh, what we've got here is really the uh, the emergence of a uh, of a new asset class. Um, it, in terms of the technology, I, I'm still um, uh, I'm, I, I'm still not the converted, but um, but what's clear to me is that uh, as an asset class, it's uh, it's it's definitely here to stay, and uh, and it is quite clear that there's a lot of people that are uh, you know sort of getting ready to get more involved with it. It's, uh, it's certainly a uh, product from that point of view, um, uh, sort of, um, wait, see, it's an answer to everyone's, uh, everyone's dream that, that wants to uh, trade something uh, a little bit more volatile and uh, with, with a lot more opportunity, I'd say. Yeah, you're right. There is there's a large segment, certainly, uh, we interact with a lot here on the network who, that, you can't argue at the end of the day, you can, take, you can take issues with the various, you know, coins and tokens and maybe their viability or practicality or their market liquidity, but you can't argue at the end of the day that you know crypto, it's a tradable asset. And that's really what people in this space, from our viewpoint, that's what they want. They want something that goes up and down, has a little bit of volatility, a little bit of volume. They'll figure out the rest. And that's kind of where I think a lot of our, a lot of our audience falls down uh, on this issue. Well, we've kind of danced around a little bit. I'm kind of curious, uh, Simon, you're, you're the co-founder of the Core Network. What the heck is it? What do you guys do over there at the Core Network? Um, yeah, so, um, so Core... Uh uh, was the brainchild of uh, uh, Holon, uh, my uh, uh, co-founder and uh, an, an ex-colleague of mine. Um, he saw the need for a forum to bring together OTC dealers in the crypto community, um, together around common issues that they face. Um, like, like, like me, he sees uh, a lot of similarities between the OTC market uh, that we we see today in uh, in crypto space and FX markets that we saw 20 years ago, particularly uh, across some of the uh, emerging markets. Um, so he, he felt that we could uh, we could bring some of our experience there and um, uh, by bringing together dealers into a uh, into a, a, a single place. Uh, really getting them to uh, to work together on uh, common issues, discuss those issues, and, uh, and try and sort of establish some uh, common solutions to them. So um, we uh, we started with uh, with a meeting uh, back in January in Singapore. Uh, we brought together uh, twenty of the most active uh, institutional OTC traders in the crypto space. Um, sat them down, uh, had a had a great meeting. A lot of interaction. It was quite a uh, sort of eye opener as to uh, some of the gaps uh, in understanding between uh, between them. Um, and um, uh, and out of that, we created uh, Cora, which is our crypto OTC roundtable Asia. 
So, um, so in our first meeting, we um, uh, we addressed things like establishing common market conventions. Um, maybe something that's taken for granted uh, when you're trading on an exchange, but uh, in the OTC market, if you've even if you've got sort of total flexibility around contracts, it's still extremely useful to have. Um, a common understanding of uh, what uh, the generic contracts are, and uh, and if you trade spot, you know what does it mean exactly? When's it going to deliver, and uh, um, <laughs> and and how, and all of the basics around that. Um, so out of that, uh, Core has grown. Uh, we had a great meeting uh, in Chicago uh, a couple of months ago with a uh, with an even bigger audience, and uh, and we're. Uh, due for another meeting uh, coming up in uh, September. Yeah, I think that's where you first came across our radar. You had your your Chicago meeting. I didn't know about it. I would maybe like to check it out, but I, f- I found out about it afterwards. And any any surprising developments? I mean, obviously, Cora stands for Asia, so it's very Asian focused. But as we've talked about many times on the on this show, the the crypto, particularly the crypto derivatives world, is really the hub is really become uh, Chicago and for much of the crypto trading you know hub has really become Chicago so with any interesting takeaways from engaging this community here that maybe you didn't hear or see in your first meeting there in Singapore yeah well I'd, I'd say um, Chicago is undoubtedly the hub of uh, not not just uh, sort of crypto exchange trading but uh, but all, all exchange trading uh, or derivative exchange trading let's say um, but uh, but but in out in Asia we've got a uh, we've got a very active uh, OTC market um, and and I'd say because um, um, there's uh, sort of uh, um, Maybe a, a slightly looser uh, regulatory environment. Uh, it, uh, it creates a, a lot of innovation um, and uh, sort of a lot of flexibility around the market. So, so things have been developing uh, pretty rapidly uh, out in Asia. Although, um, uh, although uh, as although we describe ourselves as Asia, our, uh, our participants are uh, all of the um, you know all of the global uh, top twenty names. Maybe you need a cork, you need a cork subsidiary. So uh, C O R Chicago. <laughs> How about that? There you go, cork. Doesn't really roll off the tongue as well, but you, we, we can workshop it a little bit. What do you think? I I I I I'll, uh, I'll work on that. Sure. <laughs> at, at our um, so you, you asked about our Chicago meeting and um, and the the main issues that um, uh, that were brought up there and that we're uh, work grouping at the moment uh, are around. Um, uh, Creating a, uh, a common uh, KYC standard for our dealers, uh, creating um, confirmation uh, templates for derivatives, and um, and establishing uh, settlement standards and sort of really sort of market operating uh, standards uh, and and a mechanism to, to follow up on that. So um, our focus is really around trying to make the market or the OTC market um, uh, safer and more efficient. We want dealers to be able to operate uh, in it uh, with uh, you know, a clear idea of what they're doing, a common set of uh, standards, and, uh, and that way uh, grow the market. Our, um, our ultimate um, objective is to, um, is to get the market fit for purpose for when um, institutional, um, you know, sort of traditional institutions uh, get involved and start uh, allocating capital there, which uh, we, we which we think is the obvious end game here. So when the big boys start coming to play, you want the the highway ready and paved and and ready to go for for when they come in. I understand that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's funny the OTC market always has these issues, just options, equities, call it what you will. You know, whatever whatever market you're looking at it from, there's always going to be the counterparty and and credit risk issues that are just inherent in the OTC world to begin with. And now on top of it. You add in the crypto layer, so all of the custody concerns I add into it, and it really, it really kind of exacerbates <laughs> the already problematic nature of a lot of the OTC business. I know you guys over there at Cora, you're actually working on building a, an accreditation scheme, something so you can actually maybe you know, give someone a little bit of a stamp, say, hey, this person is legitimate. They're not going to run off with your capital at a moment's notice. Is, is that kind of the plan? Um, yeah, sort of l- less around... Uh, um Credit worthiness of uh, institutions that, that that's always going to be sort of chosen uh, or sort of that that's always going to be a bilateral thing, but at least uh, we can 
um, create a mechanism whereby um, uh, dealers can approve other dealers. Um, we're, we're, we're workshopping it uh, at the moment, but uh, some kind of uh, whitelist approach to, uh, to dealers uh, seems to be the, uh, the, the, the natural approach there, I would say. Dealer whitelist. I, I like that idea. Uh, you know, you mentioned kind of one of the big buzzwords in the space right now, which is institutions. Everyone's kind of waiting for that moment when, when the big boys come to play. We've seen interesting evolutions and developments on that path. Fidelity getting in there, bringing a lot of big capital to it. Their exchange offerings there we're seeing. And I, we hear a lot of interesting things on this show and indeed behind the scenes of what's going on in the institutional space. Sometimes conflating things. Sometimes we hear one firm saying one thing depending on their perspective on the institutional space and another saying uh, you know, quite another. And so we, it's interesting to kind of hear different people's perspectives on the institutions. I'm curious, Simon, this is kind of where you guys are, are hanging your hat over there at Cora. What, what are you seeing from an institutional uptake uh, in the OTC crypto space? Are they starting to play there? Are they still kind of waiting and seeing how much uptake are you seeing on the institutional side? Yeah, so... so Within Cora, we're, we're in a sort of privileged position to be, uh, you know, to, to see a, a lot of the queries that come in from the uh, traditional space, um, and and it's clear to me that uh, there are um, a lot of big players that are all watching. Uh, that they want to know what's going on. They want to know at what point it's going to be uh, uh, sort of fit for purpose. But um, but at the same time, there, there's, there's clearly a lot of um, nervousness around the the asset class uh, and a feeling that uh, that the that the infrastructure isn't quite there and uh, it, it's not quite ready yet. Um, I, I would say the the trend is very clear. Um, we're uh, we're definitely going to see more and more uh, interest from that space. Um, although I, I think probably the pace would be a little bit slower than uh, than many uh, many hope or anticipate. Um, you know, for, um, for for these big boys to uh, move into this space, it's uh, it, it takes a lot, and there's still a considerable amount of plumbing that needs to be done uh, before they can do that. But uh, but but the work's definitely uh, underway, and certainly sort of through our, our members and connections, we can see that there, there, there's there's a huge amount of uh, investment being made right now into uh, institutional worthy infrastructure. I would say. You know, you cut your teeth obviously as an FX options trader. That's that's a marketplace that. A lot of people have looked to for comparisons over the years, obviously because they call it cryptocurrency, coins in the name. So I think a lot of people's first blush, whether it's, it's appropriate or not, is to just immediately compare them to uh, the FX space. You've been trading FX for a long time on the options side. Now you're starting to do crypto on the upstairs side. How, in your opinion, how do the two kind of compare and contrast from you know, a volatility, a volume, a skew, all, all those fun perspectives? Uh, yeah, well, um First of all, crypto isn't such a uh, strange place. It's um, the crypto market is uh, riddled with traders that have moved across from uh, the uh, the FX options space, um, and that's and that's obviously where all, all of my first contacts were. Um, uh, it, in addition, we uh, we throw a mix of uh, ex- equity traders, commodity traders, and uh, and a few uh, blockchain purists. Uh, so our um, so our core meetings are uh, are, are quite. Uh, interesting for, from that aspect to see everyone's uh, perspective on it. Um, I, I would say it's, um, FX options and crypto options. It's like chalk and cheese. Um, the uh, and, and the most obvious uh, difference is the uh, is the volatility level. Uh, FX uh, FX options are trading uh, down, you know, generally around the five vols uh, across many pairs and uh, and, and sub five. You know, we, whereas, uh, you know, clearly uh, crypto is still up there in uh, just sort of hitting around 100 uh, at the moment. Um, I, I, I think probably the, the most interesting uh, thing is that uh, I remember uh, reading a paper uh, early in my career uh, as to whether new information created volatility or, uh, or traders create volatility. And, uh, and, and being the purist, then I, 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 my view was that it's uh, new information. Um, it's clearly not the case, right? I think uh, Bitcoin options of, uh, or uh, crypto volatility have answered that, that very well. Um, there, there is certainly not, not an excess of new information in the uh, in the crypto world, but it def- definitely has an excess of um, um, speculative dealers, fear, greed. Um, these are the factors that uh, create volatility in this market. 
Um, and, uh, and what we have an absence of is, uh, is still that sort of wider, um, wider ecosystem that, that you would see for, for FX options. So, for instance, running, uh, running the, the, the uh, global trading uh, desk, we, we would deal with corporates, uh, small, large central banks, asset managers, hedge funds, private banks, uh, even retail accounts. Uh, they're, they're all involved in the market. Uh, and they've all got their own uh, drivers, um, demands, stop loss levels, you know, objectives. Um, and, and it's that that sort of creates a more balanced market, whereas uh, crypto options are, are still um, very, very focused around uh, rather a sort of small, small set of participants. Uh, I mean, or a non-diverse set of participants. And I think that that creates a, a lot of the uh, activity around the pair. Yes, you know, it is interesting. Interesting space to watch. We've had a lot of players on this on this show coming from the OTC side, and and hearing what what's going on there is always, I think, of interest to us and to a, a lot of people. I want to get into all the volume and the volatility you just touched on in the Bitcoin world in particular in a little bit. Before we wrap up, I'm just curious. A couple of questions I like to ask everybody to kind of get their pulse of the space. One of them is, of course, their 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 come to crypto moment, as you will. Another is, of course, their thoughts on institutions and what we're seeing. Also, kind of an interesting. Very contentious bit of research that re- that hit a few months back it was from the folks I believe it was Bitwise uh, who uh, were looking to list an ETF so they have a bit of an axe to grind in this space. But they came out and said all those numbers everyone quotes all day, all the market cap and volume, all ninety five percent of it is nonsense. Throw it out the window. Only five percent of that is real volume. We can actually sink your teeth into. It's, it's a as you might imagine, a bit of a contentious. A topic. I actually brought it up with SEC Commissioner recently. That'll be hitting the network soon. You can hear her response to that. But I'm curious, uh, Simon, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you concur with that? you think that's true, that only 5% of the volume that's really bandied about there is actually legitimate, or is there is there something else afoot there? Um, yeah, so, so I, I'm, it's difficult for me to, uh, to talk sort of directly about that because I'm not uh, involved in uh, that part of the market myself directly. But um, – the consensus from uh, all of the dealers that I've spoken to is that uh, yes, there, there is a massive overstatement of, uh, of volumes through the uh, through all of the different exchanges, um, and uh, and certainly on that report, it's got a a lot of very uh, compelling aspects to it. Although the ninety five percent looks like a uh, looks like a little bit of a, an exaggeration, uh, I would say. Uh, consensus seems to be uh, it's it's somewhat less than that. Um, but uh, regardless, I think that um, the, the the trend is clear that uh, that it is growing, and um, uh, yeah. So so in a way, the the, the actual numbers themselves um, are a little bit irrelevant. If uh, if the market's grown, then then that's positive. And let's see how much that's growing with a little bit of volume and a little bit of volatility back in the marketplace today. Let's keep on rolling right on into. The Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down what's going on in the world of, of Bitcoin and Bitcoin options and volatility and skew and all that good stuff. And Spoiler alert, there's some stuff going on yet again. It's been another kind of topsy-turvy, tumultuous week out there in the underlying. Coming into showtime earlier today when we were first starting to prep for the show, it was about 9,600 out there in, in Bitcoin, which put it off about 650 handles from our last show. Then it proceeded to sell off even more, sold off about another 150-odd handles, down about 94 half, and now coming into showtime, it's back up to about 95 Hundred, so you're talking about 800 or so handles off from where we were this time uh, last week, and it's kind of been a tumultuous uh, week. As we said before, show days, Mondays are always kind of the the lead volume, the hot days of the week, and that was the case again last week. We saw Bitcoin kind of topping out right around 10,330 or so. Um, not not long after the show time, and they kind of never look back from those levels. It dropped about 9,600 right around midday to late day on Tuesday. Rallied a bit on Wednesday, up to about 9,900. Sold off to about 9,500, so very follow day last Wednesday. Then rallied back up to 10,000, over 10,000, up to 10,100 again. And selling off about 400 handles on Thursday. 
rallying again, so kind of reversing it all itself on Friday, up to about almost 10,200, about 10,160. And then it got clipped pretty hard on Saturday again, down to about 9,400. And it's kind of been vacillating in kind of that level ever since 9,400, up to almost 9,700, about 96,75, which actually I believe was the high much, much earlier today. So it's been a lot of a lot of back and forth again. And today even couldn't maintain those levels we had even earlier in the day coming in to showtime the, the folks on our uh, who contribute our, a lot of our crypto stuff on the website for the folks from Crypto Patterns, they had a good quote here, and you can read it for yourself in their article at theoptionsinsider.com. They compare the current Bitcoin market to the seminal Charlie Sheen film, The Arrival, from 1996. And I guess there's a quote, Charlie Sheen's, I've never actually seen that film, but I guess he says in that movie, because we're not dead yet. And apparently that's uh, that's how they're that's their analogy for Bitcoin right now. It's Bitcoin, not dead yet, but it's it is starting to play with some lower levels that maybe uh, might be concerning to folks out there. Hit to ninety one eleven they, over the weekend on their on their analysis here. So that was on the low end. Uh, so yeah, fascinating fascinating stuff out here. Uh, Simon, I know you're out there kind of paying attention to these markets on a various basis. Has the I guess when it comes to Bitcoin now, this last week. I mean, we're not seeing the <laughs> multi-thousand point swings intraday that we were a couple of weeks ago. So I guess compared to most markets, it's pretty tumultuous. But right now, it's actually a little bit manageable. What's your take on what's been going on over there in, in spot Bitcoin for the last week or so? <laughs> yeah, well, you, you're exactly right. It's difficult to talk about uh, thousand point swings uh, in the context of consolidation. But, but um Sort of compared to the uh, the action we've seen, uh, well, a month ago, two months ago, um, it, it does look like it's getting uh, increasingly comfortable um, in, in this space. A little, little bit like a little bit like a dog settling down for the night, right? It's sort of uh, testing the bottom. Okay, failed there. Tested the top. Failed there. Back into the middle, and uh, and increasingly, it's uh, it looks like uh, this is maybe uh, um, somewhere to uh, to settle for the summer. I don't know if Bitcoin knows that word settle, sir. It seems like it just uh, it'll hit a spot for two minutes. It's like a cat. You know, it's like a cat with a laser pointed on the ground, and it's fine where it is. Then it's got to go to where the spot is. Then it's got to go over there. And it's got to jump around, follow the laser. I think uh, Bitcoin has a little bit of that in it. That's probably why the vol is still so elevated. You touched on it earlier, Simon. And looking again, a lot of this data coming from our friends over there at SKU, SK3W.co. If you haven't checked it out, I highly encourage you. To do so, it's it's kind of the only game in town for a lot of this great volatility and skew data out there in the Bitcoin options. If you check, you would see that the 30-day realize, so one-month realize, and this is the actual vol that's been exhibited over the course of the last month. Last month, pretty topsy-turvy. Uh, it's still high. It's actually down a little bit from its peak of last week, which is kind of what I was mentioning, but still very frothy, very top-heavy. It's at about 122%. It was 130% last week, so off ever so slightly, but still well north into the triple digits there. So certainly something to pay attention to as, as Bitcoin remains skittish, as those volatility levels uh, would suggest. Remember, Bitcoin can have moments of, of quiet. You know, we've seen the vol get pretty light back last November or so. We were, they were joking earlier in the, in the year with the folks in Makuna. They were, they were trying to find what other asset in the market that they were trading and market making had lower vol than, than Bitcoin. It was hard to find. It was that low. Now those days seem like a distant memory as we're kind of slinging all over the place today. In terms of slinging, though, the volume still is kind of an interesting notion. They see this volatility. We're seeing the spot lighting up, seeing the futures do some decent volume. We'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, the options, at least looking here on Darabit, is still you know, not, not lighting the world on fire. The big day was again on Monday. Not surprising. That's when we saw the big move in the, in the spot Bitcoin as well. About 41.5 million in Notional going up that day. The rest of the week, again, 30 million or less, some days less than 20. So they haven't seen the options lighting the world on fire the last couple of weeks. And that's probably why we're seeing the term structure coming in a little bit. Remember last week, we saw that big, big bid to the front of the, I think it was the July 26 contract, which obviously has gone off the board now, but that contract was showing like a 125 implied, something along those lines. That contract has gone away. Saner heads have prevailed. Uh, we're seeing the, the second augs, the weekly expiring this week down to a mere 105. So there you go, much calmer. And you go out to Deese, it goes down to about 95, a, a paltry 95 uh, from an implied vol perspective. That's how the term structure is kind of shaping up. Still very backward, the front end of that curve just bouncing all over the place, very, very frothy. Then you get out to Deese, and it, it's a much calmer, 95. <laughs> there you go. And looking at the call to put, actually it's back the other way. It's puts leading the dance 
which may be not surprising given the action we've seen over the course of the past week. Last week, it was 62% calls over puts. Uh, this week, it's kind of flipped the script. It's 36%. Uh, calls, so it puts leading the dance into the sixty four percent or so range out there so it 's really a put to call so it 's a more traditional equity put to call ratio. Remember this index actually or the ratio peaked the other way back in June when it hit its high of about seventy three and a half percent that was on June seventeenth of calls leading the dance. I was kind of in the middle of the upswing up to racing up to fourteen thousand so no surprise that calls would lead the dance now puts. Leading the charge out there. The average, if you're wondering, is about 50, almost 54% uh, calls over puts out there. So we're well off that right now. Some of that is, of course, because some of the OI has closed as well. The OI down to about $394 million from about $488 million, uh, last show. Again, this is the open interest out there uh, on the Darabit land. It's also down from the record it was a few weeks ago, which was $635 million out there. So again, the race to 14,000 really a little bit a lot of people on fire got the calls active, got the open interest up, the sell off killed some of that, but still has uh, decent numbers out there right around close to 400 million open out there on Darabit Land right now. The average if you're wondering is about 435, so we're actually a little bit a little bit shy of the average out there right now. Speaking of right now, let's go to the futures and see what's going on over there on the CME platform on the futures. And they're off, surprise, surprise, off about 460 handles, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. The, the, the gulf between the futures and the spot is always fascinating. Like I'm looking at Coindesk right now. They're showing about a 9509 on the spot Bitcoin, whereas the future 9560, the AUG contract off 460 handles right now. Decent volume, if not enormous volume, about 3,000 contracts in the AUG, uh, in the AUG front month contract, SEP about 500 and the rest kind of not doing a lot. So 3,500 contracts. Again, you're talking a 5X coin contracts, so about 17,500 in terms of coins lighting it up out there. And that's not to say though that uh, the, the contract overall hasn't been doing well. The numbers are obviously in uh, for Q2 and just in general, as of this is as of almost a week ago, as of last show, pretty much July 23rd. Uh, we saw Bitcoin futures had traded over 2 million total contracts. Again, 5X, that's 10 million total equivalent Bitcoin. That's since launch, since December of 2017. So you guys are certainly embracing uh, these contracts out there. 70 plus, because you're wondering the notional game, 70 plus billion total notional value traded in these contracts since launch. Uh, Simon, I know you play mostly in the OTC, so the the listed Bitcoin futures on CME probably not in your wheelhouse, but is this a is this a product that you watch at all to see what's going on out there and maybe trying to find some good OTC equivalents for this? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, absolutely, uh, and certainly as a reference for pricing, uh, it's the uh, it's the exchanges that you look to first. Um, I, I think it's been incredible the um, the. Um, the 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 pace at which um, futures have been adopted and the success of uh, BitMEX, um, I, and I think that that's really transformed the market as well because we've uh, we've moved from um, something that looks more like equities, very long only, uh, towards something where um, you know it's uh, it, it, we're something with a lot more leverage, uh, much easier to go short. I think that changes the whole dynamic of the market. And, uh, and so we're, when you sort of talk about um, skew in crypto options and, uh, and talk about it looking more equity-like, I, I would say uh, it, it's behaving much more like a, um, like a currency at the moment. It's much more two-way. And, and to me, the, uh, the skew is, is really just reflecting uh, – um, uh, the skew is, is reflecting uh, – uh, speculative demand for uh, for puts and calls is 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 following very much the direction of the futures. Uh, the the uh, the correlation there is very strong. Yes, the, the put to call I should say is really very equity option like right now. Uh, that's certainly because that's what everyone quotes, right? They want the put to call uh, out there, but it usually has been called a put in uh, Bitcoin options these days. Not so much. Bitmex is that where you kind of go for most of your when you're watching exchange trades? Obviously, it's not a huge destination for US for a variety of reasons that we've hit on many times. But is that when you're looking at exchange traded volumes? That normally where you're going, Simon? Well, well, well I believe that they've got about eighty percent of the uh, the volume. 
Um, so, uh, so yes, that, that, that's the, uh, the ultimate reference for all of this pricing. Uh, and then for crypto options, it's, uh, it's clearly Derivit, uh, which is uh, still um, pretty much the, the only game in town for, uh, for that sort of stuff. Yeah, only game in town indeed. As we keep on rolling, let's get into some of the other, the weirder, the, the other coins out there, a.k.a. it's time to explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody. Let's do it. Dive into the altcoin universe. This is one of the few times I'm going to mention Bitcoin, I think, in this segment. <laughs> Remember, take these market cap numbers with a grain of salt. In fact, I'll just mention the percentage of market cap. Again, that's still going to be dubious, the overall total, but I think the percentages are more reliable. Remember, somewhere around upwards of 95% of that market cap they're quoting. Probably a little bit dubious. Number one, of course, Bitcoin. And then uh, number two, uh, ETH, with about 13 and a quarter percent of the market out there. About $22.5 billion overall total market cap. Again, huge grain of salt. Number three, good old Ripple. XRP, about seven and a third percent out there, about 12 and a third overall market cap. Number four, Litecoin, about three and a third percent, about 5.7 billion, right off the top five. Good old Bitcoin Cash with about three and a quarter percent of the market cap and about five and a half billion out there. Outstanding. In terms of how these are performing since our last show, it's been another interesting one uh, to watch here coming into showtime because we have seen the story evolve a little bit. Uh, earlier this morning, we saw ETH uh, was at about 211 or so. That put it down about four and a half handles from where it was this time last show. Come into showtime now, it has given up some of that now, but another point and a quarter or so. So that puts it down nearly six handles from where it was this time last week, right around 209 and three quarters or so. So it's well off its, its highs of late, but still. Well up from where it was at the beginning of the year when we first started talking about it as well. So I think it obviously depends on your frame of reference. Our old friend XRP, a.k.a. Ripple, uh, giving up about a penny or so this week. It's, it manages to continue to just plumb new depths there in the 30-cent range. You know, everyone hoped, fingers crossed, that it had finally broken out of that low 30-cent range that it's been kind of locked in for the better part of a year. And it had a few spikes, got up to around 40-odd cents, a little bit north of that. People were excited, thought maybe... Uh, a new regime was in place, and lo and behold, here we are back again, not just through the 32, 33 cent level we were living in for a long time, but down to shy of 31 cents now. So maybe not the, not the best news for the XRP fans out there. Let's see if Litecoin has feared any better. Uh, Litecoin at about a 90, actually, excuse me, about a 90, 90, 80 uh, coming into showtime, which put it down about two and a quarter or so. It's down about 90, 30 now. So it goes down about two and three quarters handles now from where it was this time last week. Litecoin is still one of the biggest percentage winners of the year. It has really just shot up since the beginning of the year. So a little bit of uh, giving off the top there is, is not the end of the world, but still uh, another one's well off its highs. Bitcoin Cash, uh, interestingly enough, kind of looks like it's, it's bucking the trend here. Uh, this time last week, it was at about 3, oh, almost, yeah, about 3.06.90 or so. And then come into showtime, it was almost at 3.11. It was about 3.10.90 or so. It's so up about four handles. And then it has since given all that back. It is now about 3.06.90. So pretty much exactly unched from where it was this time a week ago. So a lot of vacillation out there in the realm of altcoin out here. Uh, this week, which is uh, interesting, <laughs> fascinating, uh, fun to watch, and maybe a little bit, a little bit depressing, I guess, depending on which of these, which of these altcoin you like to hang your hat in these days. Let's look out here really quickly for some of the interesting uh, developments in the world of altcoin. I mentioned I talked to the crypto mom, Commissioner Purse, out there. That'll be coming up soon. She's kind of leading the forays for crypto in the SEC side. Fascinating insight from that. But SEC has been moving in recent weeks here. We saw them on the altcoin front, at least. You know, there's all this back and forth. What's a token? What, what's a security? All that. But they have issued their second no action letter on the token side for an ETH token. This is to a firm pocket full of quarters. Everyone's favorite name. They're a gaming startup. And they want to issue tokens 
on the ETH blockchain, and the SEC pretty much came out and said you can pretty much do that, uh, which is makes them the second firm to legally sell their tokens without having to register them as securities. You may say, oh, that's kind of deep in the weeds, SEC stuff. Why does that matter to me? But that does because the more firms that can get these, by the way, the first of these no-action letters was granted back in April to a firm called Turnkey Jet. That was a business travel startup there. So diverse use cases for these for these tokens out there. But the more firms that can issue these without having to go through the laborious and expensive and time-consuming registration process to register them as securities, the more offerings we may have on this front out there as well. So maybe some of that, why we saw a little bit of a lift for a little while out there in, in altcoin, even though a lot of that seems like it has pretty much gone away since. Simon, I know a lot of the focus over there uh, for your Quora network is on the Bitcoin side, but do you have a lot of, are there a lot of firms in your network that are looking to on the altcoin side as well as ETH and some of the others? What's, what are, what are, what are they trading out there on top of the Bitcoin? What's the other hot thing that they're all looking to trade, at least on the, from the Asian perspective? Um, yeah, well, the, yeah, there, there's, there's clearly a lot of focus around the altcoins. And, uh, one of the reasons for having an OTC market is, uh, is, is exactly to find liquidity in some of these uh, some of these coins which don't necessarily have the same depth as uh, as as uh, <laughs> bitcoin obviously um it's uh it's it's pretty diverse out there and uh, to be honest i'm not uh, tracking the uh, the day to day of uh, whichever uh, bitcoin comes into uh, comes into focus or uh, or doesn't I, i'm a i'm a options trader uh, by dna and if it doesn't have an options market it's uh, difficult to get me uh, too excited about it yeah i hear you i think a lot of our audience falls into that camp as well but um i cer- certainly um certainly agree with you on the uh, on the importance of the uh, of the reg side um, the more clarity that we can get around that, the uh, the better it is for our market, uh, for sure. And uh, and this is sort of very important question for a lot of tokens as to uh, whether their securities or uh, utilities or currencies, whatever, is um, is is absolutely key to a uh, to a lot lot of our members uh, in in how they're regulated, how they're dealt with, and all of those aspects. So um, so it's it's great that that we're, we're seeing progress there. And I think that this is this is ultimately how we're going to see a uh, uh, the growth of a more robust, uh, bigger, more efficient market. It's it's through uh, more and more um, sort of um, regulatory um, um, clarity. I think we all can use a little bit more clarity. Let's see if we can give you some by answering some of your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody. Let's get to it. Answer some of your questions, your far-reaching questions from the world of crypto. Let's start off with this one, Simon. This is kind of analogous to what we were just talking about. And uh, you, you can kind of bring the Asian perspective, even though you're beaming in from London. <laughs> we'll, let you, we'll let you bring the Asian perspective here on the show. Nichols. Nichols wants to know, are there different crypto products lighting up the overseas market? He puts in parentheses Asia and Europe than we're seeing in the U.S. markets. Well, the U.S. markets are kind of kind of nascent still. I think we'll get to this on the regulatory side as well. You know, we got the listed futures. We have CME. SIBO got out of the game, so there's one fewer player there. Now you got all the spot stuff you can do out there. Uh, but from an actually listed, regulated U.S. market options, there's not a lot, quite frankly, pun intended. So it seems like there is that the growth we've seen, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, has been in the overseas market. Simon, you hang your hat in Asia. Obviously, we're just talking a lot about uh, spot Bitcoin, the futures and the options therein. Do you find there are other more esoteric products out there that are starting to capture some mind share in Asia as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, m- maybe not, um, maybe not Asia specific, but certainly outside of the exchange uh, listed space. Um, the the biggest game in town right now is the uh, lending and borrowing market. Um, we, we've seen uh, massive growth there amongst uh, amongst the OTC community to. Um, you know, to start lending uh, crypto assets, borrowing dollars with crypto collateral, 
um, it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting, uh, and, there's, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, it's exciting because um, it uh, adds weight to the story of crypto behaving more like an asset class now. Now, if you can, uh, if you can lend it, if you can borrow it, if you can um, use it as collateral, then um, then it makes it uh, much more useful as a as an asset class, and you can uh, um, you know, start developing other products on top of that. I like it. I like it. Uh, let's see. Let's keep it rolling here. Um, oh, buddy, Mark Brandt listening live. He wants to know. I'll, I'll give him the family-friendly version of it. What the heck is taking CME so long in getting options on Bitcoin futures? Yeah, I, I feel your frustration there, Mark, and a lot of our audience does as well. Everyone, when I've said this before, you know, when everyone was all hot and bothered, when Bitcoin was racing to 20000 they had just launched the futures in December of 2017. So coming into the new year then, 2018, we, everyone was super excited about the prospect for options on the futures. I mean, SIBO had them seem like a no-brainer. SIBO would list options on a future. Go figure. Options are their bread and butter. Uh, CME would probably certainly follow suit. It seemed like a no-brainer would happen probably by at least Q2 of that year, if not earlier. And then here we are. You're right. Over a year later and nothing. Nothing on that front. SIBO out of the game now. And I've asked them this many times. Uh, you probably can hear it on the, on the network if you haven't, listeners. You go back to our special events feed. I did a panel with a bunch of people, including, including Tony Saliba and uh, Julie the number, the chief commercial officer over there at CME, I asked her that question there on the stage back from last August. Why don't we have the options? Uh, she seemed to imply then that they were more leaning towards more futures than options on the existing futures they had. So ETH and others. And uh, we've had, you know, others on the, the TWIFO show and others from CME since then in the intervening year uh, that have kind of echoed that same kind of sentiment. We've also seen CME recently rejiggering their ETH reference rate. That seems to be leading to, I mean, why would you do that unless you had a plan to list something on that rate? And, and the Bitcoin reference rate seems to be working, getting the ETH reference rate in line with that. And then maybe that seems like a necessary precursor to listing a tradable product on that. I'm with you, though. I'd much rather to see options on the product they just have. They have, you know, the argument against these things has always been, well, the futures don't do a ton of volume yet. And they're doing volume. And also that volume, when you take 95% of the spot Bitcoin volume away because <laughs> it's probably fake. That puts the volume we're seeing on the futures in a much starker relief. Then it, it seems a much more high volume product than maybe it did six months ago when you looked at the when you're breaking it down by the numbers. So yeah, I, I'm with you. I think I think we're going to see probably make an ETH future maybe next. But yeah, I would love if they came out tomorrow and said, "Hey, forget it all. We're going to list options on these futures we've been trading for a while." I would be probably one of the happier campers out there, Mark. Uh, Simon, has it surprised you? I mean, I think everyone and their mother was betting that the U.S. was where we were inches away from listing options here in the U.S. It never happened, and SIBO went the other way and shut everything down. Are you surprised that here we are a year and a half later from listing futures in the U.S., and, and no one has listed a, an actual option that you could trade on an exchange here yet? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no. I, I mean, it's been a... Um it's been a very long journey for the futures products, right? We, uh, you know, li- listed it 18 months ago. It took uh, it took a good year before uh, we started seeing any uh, any real volume growth there. Um, but but I agree, it's, it looks like a very important market now, and uh, and they're definitely doing a, a sufficient amount. Um, the the jump to listing options, I think, is actually quite a big one because um, you you split your liquidity across uh, so many more. Um, strikes, dates, you know, it's, um, it, it, it becomes significantly diluted. So I, I would have thought that their main consideration is just that they want to be sure that when they list, they're going to have sufficient uh, price makers and sufficient liquidity around the contract um, and avoid having to, uh, you know, get into a situation where they uh, delist later or it's seen as a flop. So um, I, I, I think it's just a matter of time, but, uh, but it may take a little bit longer. Um, and certainly we need to see uh, you know, a bit more volume growth out of, uh, say, Deribit uh, and the other platforms first. Yeah, you're right, because they're the kind of the big dog in the space right now because there aren't many others. And we've talked about it just at the top of the show. The volume isn't lighting the world on fire there either. But then again, maybe because a lot of the, the U.S. players can't get into that market without going through a lot of hoops. 
Uh, maybe if they had something here that they could actually trade a lot more easily, they could go to their actual broker <laughs> that they use right now for everything else, their equities and some options and futures trading. Say, so, hey, I want to trade an option on that Bitcoin contract. Maybe that would, would drive more volume. Uh, but I, I understand your, the concerns out there. The exchanges don't want to have a failed product. It's kind of one of the worst things they could have. So they, they try to avoid that at all costs. But I'd much rather see the list some options and then maybe we grow the liquidity and and go from there. I think they would probably feed into each other. If you have options, you trade more futures against it and vice versa. Dogs and cats living together. Everyone's, everyone's happy at the end of the day. Certainly our audience would be. They don't like to wait, Simon. They, they, want, things, they want things now. And I, I, have a hard time. I have a hard time blaming them on that. Let's wrap it up with this one. This comes from History. History X. He or she wants to know kind of the hot issue in the crypto space right now. What are your thoughts on Libra and its potential impact on the crypto market? Well, we've seen the impact already. The thing is just a pretty much a thought piece at this point, and it's already pretty much, if not single-handedly responsible, pretty close to turning uh, Bitcoin and others off their highs. Remember, it was when Powell started talking about Libra, and he set off all those regulatory fears and concerns, and then you know, Mnuchin and others started piling in and following up, and congressmen and women are in there piling in. It, that's just really just annihilated the crypto space across the board. The looming specter of regulation doesn't really seem to to fit well with the bullish, strong bullish upswing in the marketplace. So it seems like it's already had a big impact and that just it really clipped the wings off of Bitcoin. There's a lot of things driving it. Obviously, there's whales, there's limited liquidity, a bunch of things, maybe a bit of a short squeeze that drove it up to that level to begin with. But still, you can't argue that the turn came right around the time of uh, when Powell first started hitting on Libra and it Hasn't really looked back at those. I'll have to go back and look and see exactly where it was. If it was 12900 somewhere at that level when he started mentioning it. But it was uh, either way. It was markedly north of where we are right now. So I think we've seen already. And it's still just a, a theoretical issue at this point. But we've already seen a lot of the impact. Is this uh, something that's lighting up your network over there, Simon? Or are they kind of playing more of the wait and see game? And then they'll get excited about it. Um, no, it's, uh, it's undoubtedly important. Um, I'd, I'd say, from a trading point of view, it's, um, this is a, this is a classic uh, buy the rumor, sell the fact. It was a uh, heavily anticipated event, and uh, and I think a, a lot of the rally that we saw from uh, low levels of Bitcoin uh, previously were, were off the back of that. Um, it's, it's not really a huge surprise that, that we see the uh, that we see the top coincide with the uh, the actual announcement. Um, from a reg point of view, obviously they've got a uh, they've got a, a, a massive fight on their hands. Um, none of the regulators are, uh, are going to be particularly happy about a uh, non-sovereign currency, but they've certainly got the size and they've definitely got the use case. Um, I, I don't think there's any doubt that a uh, that a global trading currency that can be used on uh, you know, by retail on various uh, apps uh, would be extremely useful. And if you look at uh, something like the uh, the Chinese market and uh, and the you know and the way that uh, currency is linked in with things like WeChat, I think it's um, I, I I think it's clear that uh, that's what the market needs and that's where we're going. Now, wh- whether it's going to happen through Libra or not, I, I don't know. But it's uh, it's great that um, that the market's turning towards this as a solution and uh, accepting that. Uh, Okay, maybe uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies uh, do do have a uh, um, a place in uh, common culture. Well said, sir. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of another epic journey through the world of crypto. We had a lot of fun stuff to talk about on the show today. Talked quite a bit about OTC from an Asian perspective. Broke down all the volume and volatility and all the fun stuff going on in the world of Bitcoin. A little bit of altcoin. Answer some of your questions. All sorts of fun things. But before we go, Simon, if our listeners are curious, they want to learn more about the core network, maybe they want to become a member, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, can check out our website. It's uh, network. Very easy. That is easy. There you go. Cora, Cora.network, listeners, is the place to go to learn more and become a member of the network yourself and help build the OTC infrastructure not just in Asia, but here in the U.S. Do you have any uh, upcoming meetings, Simon? Maybe anything back in our neck of the woods anytime soon? Um, we're, uh, we're, we're meeting up in uh, Singapore in uh, September. Uh, we've got a pretty, uh, pretty heavy agenda there. Um, and I'm sure we'll be out, back out your way uh, 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 soon. I don't know if I can make the Singapore 
event, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my darndest next time you guys come to Chicago or somewhere nearby uh, to try to, uh, to swing by and check it out for myself. The Cora Network, check it out, listeners. And on behalf of Simon and, indeed, myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in questions, for listening live, all the fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming. We'll be back here tomorrow on the network with the advisor's option. Wednesday, you're going to get hit hard and heavy by some OPR, a.k.a. some options of public radio, answering a bunch of your questions. Those huddle episodes are always fun. Thursday, we're back here for the option block and TWIFO, Friday Ball Views. And we're back again to do it all again next week. So we'll see you then for more of the Crypto Rundown. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. At Fidelity, you'll always get a great value for your options trades. And with powerful investing tools that provide clear next steps, plus independent research and a wide range of investment types, we can help you make better trading decisions. Learn more about options trading with Fidelity at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC, SIPC.